Okay. This is like the third time I'm trying to record this review, because every time I try to record, somebody just comes into this room and they just go, Hey buddy, what you doing? And I'm, I try to put a smile on my face while in my head I'm actually saying, I want to murder you in your sleep. Ugh. Okay. Tampopo, probably one of the most famous titles in non-art house-ish modern Japanese cinema. And my introduction into non-art house Japanese cinema was this film called Handsome Suit. Um, I did not watch it by my own choice. I had to see it because everybody else was seeing it at my middle school, and I hated it. Quite frankly, it was insulting to my intelligence. I wanted everybody on, on I I wanted everybody who worked on that film to die. Um, and yet. Even though I hated the movie, I still found something about the film that I never noticed about Japanese films. Because usually, before that film, all I saw was, like, Ozu, Mizuguchi, um, obviously, like, really incredibly famous anime movies, and Kurosawa. That's all I've seen of Japanese cinema. And with this film, I found a genuine quirkiness that I never found in those other movies. And I've ne I just never saw this before. And uh, eventually I saw this in, like, films like Haosu and whatever. But Haosu is a very, uh, an extreme anomaly amongst the, film that, the films that I've seen. Um, and, um, later on, I've realized that Japanese comedies usually have this vibe. People act really animated. They're kind of, the performances are very over the top. The expressions are very over the top. The comedy isn't necessarily subtle. Sorry, I just had I just had lunch and it uh, uh my indigestion's just working up. Um, in many ways, Tampopo has basically made me, has basically made me reconsider every preconception that I had about modern Japanese comedies that I that I, that kind of made uh, that that I had after watching Handsome Suit. Um, because quite frankly, I've never seen a film like Tampopo. I've never, and I, I rarely say that, I've, when I see a great movie, like, I've seen movies like these before, but I've, I really haven't seen anything like Tampopo before. The quirkiness, I, I mean, now that I've seen Tampopo, I feel like I know where the quirkiness comes from, um, I feel like, it comes from two very different influences, um, one of the influences would be 30s, 40s, um, like, Hollywood screwball comedies, because it has similar timing. It doesn't necessarily have the, like, spitfire dialogue that, um, films like Bring Up Baby or, um, His Girl Friday would have, but it has the same f timing when it comes to the physical comedy. Um, and there, it's definite, and it's definitely influenced by classic East Asian theater, whether it's Koreans of Pansori or all the mask dances in, in Japan and whatnot. Um, and it's, and the films definitely have similar body languages. Now, obviously, when you watch films like Rashomon, those art housey Japanese movies also have theatrical, uh, East Asian theater influences as well, but they take more of the theatrical aspect of the theater rather than the, the satiric aspect of the theater. And with, with these comedies, the satiric aspect comes in two folds. Um, also, the, the dark, surrealistic, supernatural influences definitely comes from, comes from a lot of East Asian theater, and just East Asian culture in general. Um, it's just the kind of energy you don't find in Mizuguchi or Kurosawa. And let's get into to what the film is about. The film is about food. It's about food and how it strangely closely relates to how people live, how we are, and just human nature in general. And in many ways, that's something that people really should get into film-wise. Because when we look back, a lot of our memories kind of relate with food. When we go to a different country, yeah, sure, we're gonna, you know, take photos of buildings and monuments and whatnot, but then the the thing we remember the most, the thing that we instinct instinctively remember is the food. As long as you actually eat the food that comes from that place and don't find, like, a fucking Korean restaurant in fucking Italy like the crew that I went with when I went to Italy. That was just stupid. Um, but mostly, films about food are very shallow. 
most of the time. They could go into two different categories. One of the categories would be basically food porn. It's basically food porn. There are there's no story. There's ba there's barely any character development. It's just there to show how good the food it is. It's just there to show you that these movies movie stars are able to afford all of this good shit by just going around the world, and we can't do it because we're normal people. And quite frankly, they those movies just piss me off. Um, and then there's the other movie where they the the food making part is a subplot. It's part, it drives the plot to a certain extent. Maybe the main characters cook. Maybe the film has to do something with a restaurant. But usually. It's more character driven, but unfortunately, those films fail to really intertwine the character aspect of the movie and the uh, the food aspect of the movie. Um, it it feels very separate, but here it's it's basically one: the human aspect of the film and the food aspect of the movie. The commentary on both sides is basically one whole thing. Now, the main story is about this woman who's trying to master the art of ramen noodles, and there's this, like, this mythical guy who's... Mythical, mysterious guy who looks like the, Jap uh, the Japanese equivalent of Indiana Jones trying to help her make the perfect bowl of ramen, which honestly sounds more like an anime plot, if anything. And there are these long takes of her lovingly and diligently honing her craft, which also goes with the idea of how human nature and just how we live really relates a lot with food. By showing her whole life being devoted to food, the film's emphasizing that part. And again, the animated acting gives it all a very peppy vibe. Those long takes are not boring at all. They're very exciting, actually, mostly because the acting. And the colorful... the, the uh, Again, the R's. I have a problem with the R's because... I'm Asian, and that's just gonna be the way it is for the rest of my life. The colorful characters add a lot of dynamics to the film. And um, honestly, at times, even though the acting's very animated and though it's not boring, some of the long shots kind of create this zen-like feel to it that makes it makes the whole thing feel very meditative at times. Um, and this, there are a lot of side stories, and that's really where the film kind of creates its own strength and its own niche as a, as just a film, not even as a genre, but as a film. It explores other aspects of the relationship between food and people by going into these side stories of characters that never come back. These are just, basically, just, it's not even a subplot. It's a side story that never, we never reference, the film never references again, refer references these characters and these stories again. They just happen and they just go by. And then we come back to the main story of the woman trying to hone, his cra hone her craft of making ramen noodles. Um, and these side stories emphasize much deeper aspects of the whole relationship between food and, food and people. You know, it emphasizes how sexual pleasure is almost equivalent to the pleasure of eating good food. There's this... There are two scenes where it's basically with the same couple. Um, the, the, this couple comes back once in a while. They, they kind of remind me of the... In Ingrid Bergman and uh, Humphrey Bogart couple from Casablanca. Why can't I remember the goddamn name of that those characters? It's been a while since I've seen Casablanca. Goddamn. Um, and there's this scene where they're both naked, and they're not having sex, but they're playing around with food. They're, like, plastering each other with whipped cream. They do something really weird with a, with a live fish, and I have a hard time explaining it. But it's, it's clearly trying to be erotic, and it's clearly trying to relate th this imagery of food with, sexual, with the sexual imagery that th they're trying to portray. Um, and the film also talks about how our core memories are linked to food. A again, this also relates to the couple that I'm talking about right now. Um, and it, th there's also this sub-story about how elegance and posture means nothing when you eat food. Because usually when you go to this fancy restaurant, you're told that this is the salad knife, this is the steak fork or whatever, and this is the soup spoon. But then, when you actually eat food, none of the enjoyment is completely gone when you think too much about the silverware. 
Sometimes you make noise when you eat pasta. Sometimes you just enjoy it. That's the important part of eating food. It's not posture. It's about how it goddamn tastes. And, you know, it, it's kind of talking about the primal aspect of the whole... Primal aspect of eating food and whatnot. And it also talks about how there's this great loving conviction and dedication when it comes to cooking food. Um, and there are just these small moments that are just beautiful, like this kid eating ice cream and whatnot. Um, now, and because these side stories are kind of inserted into this film in ra at random moments, the film maintains an excitement because the audience never knows what's going to happen. It, it, the film literally is um, unpredictable, and it flows so seamlessly, even though it really shouldn't. The one flaw of the film, quite frankly, is... That some of the side stories, while charming, are kind of pointless. There's this one side story about this crazy lady in a supermarket, and it's completely pointless. Um, still, the film is clearly passionate about what about its subject matter, and it's it's quite frankly original. It's one it's really one of those movies that I've just never seen before. That it's one of those kinds of movies that I just never seen before. So I think everybody should watch it. I I fully charged this camera and it's already losing battery. For fuck's sakes, I'm done. Review over. Top of book. Go and watch it. It's great. Ugh.